Hi, Year 6. Um, so I'm going to read the next couple of chapters of Room 13 for you. I know Mrs Withers started you off with the story um, on uh, yesterday um, with the first couple of chapters. Room 13 is one of my favourite books. It's um, it's just really good. It builds up suspense. It's, it's quite funny in parts. Um, and it's just, uh, the year six last year, I absolutely loved this book and lo I love reading it. So quite looking forward to reading this to you through the next few weeks. Um, I'm going to start from chapter three. So I think you've met um, Fliss and Ellie Mace, and heard about Ellie Mace of London and all these different characters so far. Uh, and I'm going to carry on from chapter three. So it says, they were off by 25 past nine, growling slowly up the drive while Mr. Joyce and a handful of parents stood in a haze of exhaust, waving. Fliss and Lisa managed to get seats together. Lisa had one by the window. As the coach turned onto the road, she twisted around for a last glimpse of the school. Goodbye, bottom top, she cried, and good riddance. That'll do, Lisa Watmore. Startled, she turned. Mrs Evans was sitting two rows behind her, glaring at her through the space between the headrests. Yes, miss, she faced the front, took Fliss in the ribs and giggled. I didn't know she was sitting so close. Where's Mrs. Marriott? Back seat so she can keep an eye on us all. And Mr. Hepworth's up there with the driver. Huh? Trust teachers to grab all the best seats. Who's this in front of us? The top of two heads showed above the headrests. Gary Bazard and David Trotter. Ah, uh, I hope we're nowhere near them in the hotel. You won't be, said Eddie May, who was sitting across the aisle from Fliss. Ah, Shelley says they put girls on one floor and boys on another, so you don't see each other with nothing on. Ah, Shelley, sneered Fliss. Ah, Shelley this. Ah, Shelley that. I hope we're not going, I know we're not going to have another week of what our ah, Shelley says, Ellie May. Huh? Ellie May tossed her head. I was telling you how it'll be. That's all misery guts. Anyway, you can naff off if, if you want to do out else. You won't get it from me. Good. Fliss shuffled in her seat, turning as far from Eddie May as she could, and sat scowling across Lisa at the passing scene. Lisa looked at her. What's up with you? she hissed. We're supposed to be enjoying ourselves, and you look like somebody with toothache going into double maths. It's her. Fliss jerked her head in Eddie May's direction. She gets on my nerves. She was only telling you. You wanted to know if we'd be anywhere near Baz and Trot, and she says we won't. What's wrong with that? Fliss shrugged. Nothing. Well then, I don't feel too good, right? I had this dream last night. A nightmare, and I couldn't sleep after it. And then in the morning, in the hall, Bazaar starts going on about Dracula, saying he lives in Whitby, stuff like that. And I wasn't in the mood. Lisa pulled a face. No need to take it out on other people, though, is there? You could go and sleep here on the coach. Look, the seat tips back. Lie back and shut your eyes. There's nothing to look at anyway, unless you like the middle of Leeds. So Fliss pressed the button on the armrest and tipped her seat back. But then the boy in the seat behind yelled out that she was crushing his knees and demanded that she return it to the upright position. When she refused, settling back and closing her eyes, the boy, Grant Cooper, began rhythmically kicking the back of the seat, like somebody beating on a drum. Fliss sighed but kept her eyes closed, saying nothing. As she had anticipated, Mrs Evans soon noticed what the boy was up to. A hand came snaking through the gap between the headrests and grabbed a fistful of hair. Ow! he yelped. Mrs Evans rose so that the top part, top part of the face appeared over the seat. She began speaking very quietly to Grant Cooper, punctuating her words by alternating tight, alternately tightening and relaxing her grip on his hair. Grant Cooper, squeeze. The upholstery on the, that seat cost a lot of money, squeeze. It was fitted to make this coach both smart and comfortable, squeeze. It was not provided so that horrible little so-and-sos like you could use it for football practice, squeeze. How do you think you, your mother would like it if somebody came into your house and started kicking the back of your three-piece suite, eh? Squeeze, eh? Squeeze. Like it? Would she? Squeeze. Please, miss. No, miss. Grant's eyes were watering copiously, and his mouth was twisted into a grimace which would not have been out of place in a medieval torture chamber. 
Well then, squeeze. Kindly show the same respect for other people's property that your mother would expect to be shown to hers. All right, Grant Cooper? Squeeze? Yes, miss, the grip loosened. The hand withdrew, Grant slumped like a man cut down from the whipping post and wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. Mrs Evans's face sank from view. Fliss smiled faintly to herself and drifted off to sleep. Chapter 4 Fliss opened her eyes as the coach swung into a tight turn which nearly catapulted her into the aisle. What's happening? Where are we? Pickering, said Lisa. We're stopping. You've been asleep ages. Fliss looked out. They were rolling onto a big car park with a wall all around it. As the coach stopped, Mr Hepworth stood up at the front. This is Pickering, he said, and we are making a toilet stop. His eyes swept along the coach and locked onto those of a boy near the back. A toilet stop, Keith Halliday, not a shopping stop, not a sightseeing stop, not a let's buy packets of greasy fish and chips, scoff the lot before Sir Caesar's and then throw up all over the coach. Stop. Have I made myself quite clear? Sir. Yes, sir. Right. The toilets, he pointed, are down at the bottom of this car park. To get into them, you have to go out onto the pavement. It's a very busy road and I don't want to see anyone trying to cross it. Neither do I want to see boys going into the ladies' toilets or girls into the gents. Have I said something funny, Andrew Roberts? Uh, no, sir. Right. He looked at his watch. It's ten past eleven. The coach will leave here at twenty-five past on the dot. Make sure you're on it because it's a long, long walk back to Bradford. When we get back on, whispered Fliss to Lisa, it's my turn for the window seat, right? Lisa nodded. You feeling better then? Yeah, thanks. I had a really lovely sleep. I know. You missed a lot, though. There was this field, a sloping field with millions of poppies in it. The whole field was red. It was wicked. When Fliss got back on the coach, there was no sign of Lisa. She sat down and watched the kids strangling across the tarmac, tarmac in the warm sunshine. Soon, everyone was back on board except her friend. The driver had started the engine and Mrs Marriott was counting heads when Lisa appeared from behind the toilet block and came hurrying back to the coach. As she clambered aboard, Mr Hepworth looked at his watch. What time? What time did I say we would be leaving, Lisa Watmore? Some of the children were sniggering and Lisa blushed. Twenty-five past, sir. I forgot the time. Sorry, sir. You forgot the time? Well, for your information, it is now twenty-six minutes to twelve, and we'll be lucky if we arrive at the hotel by midday, which is when we are expected. The meal which has been prepared for us might well be ruined, and it will all be your fault, Lisa Watmore. He bent forward, suddenly peering at her jeans. What have you got there? Something was making a bulge in the pocket of Lisa's jeans and she was trying to conceal it with her hand. Uh, nothing, sir. Take it out and give it to me, please. It's just this, sir. She pulled out an object wrapped in tissue paper and handed it over. The teacher stripped away the wrapping to reveal a green plastic torch in the shape of a dragon. The bulb and its protective glass were in the dragon's gaping mouth. Mr. Hatworth held up the torch using only his thumb and forefinger and looked at it with an expression of extreme distaste. Did you bring this, this thing with you from home, Lisa Watmore? No, sir, honest. Oh, then I suppose there's a little kiosk inside the ladies' toilet where patrons can do a bit of shopping, am I right? No, sir. The teacher frowned. Then I'm afraid... I don't understand. You didn't bring it from home and you didn't get in the ladies. You haven't been anywhere else, yet here it is. Maybe, perhaps you laid it like a hen lays an egg, did you? No, sir. Then what did you do? I went in a shop, sir. You did what? I went in a shop, sir. Then what had I said about shopping, Lisa Watmore, just before you got off the coach? That we weren't to do any, sir. Right, then why did you go into that shop? I don't know, sir. You don't know, and neither do I, but here's something I do know. 
This evening, when the rest of the group is listening to a story in the hotel lounge, you will be in your room writing two apologies. One to the children for having kept them waiting, and one to me for having disobeyed my instructions. When both apologies have been written to my satisfaction, this torch will be returned to you. In the meantime, you can leave it with me. Go to your seat. What the heck did you do that for? whispered Fliss as Lisa slid into her seat. Lisa was one of those girls who seldom steps out line and rarely is in trouble at school. She shook her head miserably. I don't know, Fliss. I don't even need a torch. I've got a better one at home. You think I'm crazy, but I couldn't help it. It was as though my feet were going by themselves. Oh, don't you start, groaned Fliss. What do you mean? Nothing. Forget it, she looked out the window. They passed a sign, North Yorkshire Moors National Park. The coach was climbing. Fliss gazed out as green pasture gave way to treeless desolation. And she shivered. Chapter 5 Hey, look! A boy on the right side near the front of the coach stood up and pointed. Everybody looked. Out of the bleak landscape rose three white dome-shaped objects, like gigantic mushrooms breaking through the earth. As the coach carried them closer, they saw a scatter of low buildings and a fence. The great spheres gleaming in the sunlight looked like objects in a science fiction movie. Wow, what are they, sir? Mr Hepworth got up. That's the Fillingdale's early warning station, he told them. Inside those domes, inside those domes is radar equipment operated by the British and American forces. It, ma it maintains a round-the-clock watch for incoming missiles. They say it would give us a three-minute warning, he smiled wryly. Three minutes in which, to, in which to do whatever we haven't done yet and always wanted to. What would you do, sir? asked the grinning Wazim Kadar. What would I do? the teacher thought for a moment. I think I'd get a brick and throw it through the biggest window I could find, he smiled. I've always fancied doing that. Oh, I wouldn't, sir. I'd run to the Chinese and get a chicken chop suey ten times and gobble it right quick. Yeah, cried Sarah Jane Potts. That's what I'd do and all. We wouldn't have to pay, would we, sir? I'd get a big club and smash our Shelley's head in, said Ellie May. I hate her. There'd be no point, fathead, sneered a boy behind her. She'd be dead in three minutes anyway. The noise level rose, excited voices calling back and forth across the coach as everybody tried to outdo it, everybody else in what they'd do with the last three minutes of their life. The fact that many of them would have needed several hours or even days to carry out their plans was disregarded and the discussion continued till the vehicle top, topped the highest rise and Mrs Marriott raised her voice, drawing everybody's attention to the ruins of Whitby Abbey, Whitby Abbey which were now visible in the hazy distance. Gary Bazard knelt, leering at Fliss over the back of his seat. See, that's where Dracula lives, in the ruins. Old Hepworth told us. Old Hepworth told you no such thing, replied Phyllis. The boy's remark had coincided with a lulling conversation as every strained for a glimpse of the Abbey, and Mr Hepworth had heard it. Old Hepworth told you that Bram Stoker, who created the character of Dracula, was inspired to do so after seeing the ruined Abbey. Dracula does not live there or anywhere else. He is a figment of Stoker's imagination, Gary Bazard. And sometimes I wish the same might be said of you. There was a laughter at this. The boy's cheeks reddened as he resumed his seat. Fliss smiled faintly, gazing out the distant ruins and beyond them to the sea. It was ten past twelve when the coach drew up outside the Crow's Nest Hotel. Mr and Mrs Wilkinson, who ran for it, who ran it, were standing on the top step waiting for them. Lisa flushed, remembering what Mr Hepworth had said about being it it all being her fault. She hoped he wouldn't point out her out to the Wilkins as the Wilkinsons as the culprit. Check under your seats and on the luggage rack, warned Mrs. Marriott, as everybody stood up as, as, as everybody stood up. Don't leave any of your property in the coach. The children checked, then filed slowly along the aisle and down onto the pavement. It was sunny, but a breeze blew from the sea, making it cooler than it would would now be in Bradford. The driver went round the back and started unloading bags and cases, which their owners quickly claimed. Fliss looked at the hotel. There was something vaguely familiar about the steps. The porch. 
even the breeze and the distant sound of the sea. When everybody had their luggage, Mr. Hepworth led them, back, led them into the hotel. Fliss looked at the iron bird on the black gate. For a moment she thought it was meant to be a gull, but then she remembered the name of the place and decided it was probably a crow. Somebody had made a poor job of painting it. Trips had run down to the edges of its wings and hardened there, giving them a webbed, spiky appearance. So they looked more like a bat than a bird. Okay, I'm going to leave it there, guys. Uh, we'll continue with chapter six tomorrow. See you later. Bye.